Hey there guys and girls. In this video, we're going to learn a little bit about friction, which is kind of deceptively simple, so I really need you to make sure that you're paying close attention and that you're taking good notes today. Um, friction is a force, like all the other things we're studying now, that exists between two surfaces which are pressed together. So they actually have to be in contact and there has to be force pushing the surfaces together. Friction is always parallel to the surface and it opposes the relative motion between the two surfaces. Now note that the key word there is relative. Friction does not always slow things down. In fact, there's lots of situations where friction is what speeds things up. So right away, we kind of need to get rid of that idea. So it is true that friction opposes the motion of the two surfaces, not necessarily the motion of the object. Look at a few examples here in just a second. So, three real simple examples. Uh, the first one's kind of the most simple. Suppose we just have something like a box which is sliding to the right. If it's sliding to the right, that means that friction must be either to the left or to the right. Since friction is opposing the motion between the box and the surface it's on, then it would go to the left. So in this situation, friction would be slowing the object down. Second example, suppose we have a similar box which is sliding down an incline. In that situation, friction would go up the incline, poses the motion of the box relative to the incline. Now here's a third example. Suppose that we have a truck which is accelerating to the right and we put a box in the back of the truck. In that case, friction would be acting to the right in the direction that the truck is accelerating. The reason that it's making the box speed up is because it is trying to keep the box at rest relative to the surface of the truck bed. And so here's a situation where friction is opposing the relative motion between the truck and the box and the net effect of that is that it causes the box to move forwards relative to the ground. So here's a situation where friction is speeding something up. So remember the key word is it, that friction opposes the relative motion between the two surfaces. So think of all the times when you speed something up with friction. You put something in the back of your car, back of a truck, what have you. You're speeding things up using friction when you make those things go faster. So there are two kinds of friction. The first we typically refer to as kinetic friction. Remember the word or the prefix kine, K-I-N-E, means moving. So in kinetic friction, the two surfaces are moving relative to each other. The second kind of friction is called static friction. Static's the opposite of kinetic. Static means that the surfaces are at rest relative to each other. So kinetic is moving, static is still or at rest. We symbolize kinetic friction with force friction subscript K so we say force subscript F comma K like that and then we use something similar for static friction we use an S instead of a K. An example of kinetic friction was the first one that I just drew something like the box sliding to the right. An example of static friction would be like the third example. The box was at rest relative to the truck bed therefore that is static friction which is making it speed up. The force of kinetic friction depends on two things. It depends on the normal force between the surfaces, so F subscript N, basically how hard the two surfaces are pressed together. Uh, to get an understanding of that, think about when you try to erase something. If you have a really dark mark on your paper and pencil and you're trying to erase it, you're going to push down harder to increase the frictional force. The frictional force is what allows you to erase stuff from your paper. The second thing that the force of kinetic friction depends on is the nature of the surfaces. Basically, how rough are the two surfaces. The way that we quantify this is with something called the coefficient of friction, which we give the symbol mu, that's the Greek letter mu right here, 
with a subscript k, k for kinetic. And so we have a real simple equation for friction. Kinetic friction is equal to mu times the normal force. That's something that's always going to be true. For static friction, it's a little bit more complicated. Static friction is lazy, which means it's only going to push as hard as it needs to push in order to keep something at rest. And so it's going to depend on what other forces are present on the object. So the basic idea here is that static friction is going to be however large it needs to be and in whatever direction it needs to be in in order to keep the surfaces at rest. So in other words, it's going to be variable. And so we're not going to have so much an equation for finding the static friction force on something. We'll use our free body diagrams and net force equations just like we've always done. So let's look at a few examples. Suppose that we have some random 4 kilogram box which is sliding to the right on a level surface. Coefficient of friction between the surface and the box is known, and we're going to say that it is about 0 0.05. And we want to know what is the force of kinetic friction on the box. So since it's moving, keyword here slides, we know that the friction will be kinetic. So that's the keyword that tells us kinetic friction is involved. So if we draw a free body diagram, since it's on a level surface, the normal force and weight will be equal to each other. They'll balance. And then friction will be acting to the left. There's nothing telling me there's anything pushing it to the right. And so we'll just leave our free body diagram like that. And so the force of kinetic friction is equal to mu times the normal force. Since the weight of this thing is 40 newtons, that means that the normal force must also be 40 newtons. And so the coefficient of friction was 0.5, and then the normal force is 40 newtons. So half of 40 newtons would be 20 newtons. And then don't forget about the direction. So since we know that force should be in newtons, force should be in newtons, notice that the coefficient of friction doesn't have any units. In other words, it's a ratio. It's a ratio of a newton over a newton. And so we won't have any units with our coefficient of friction. Let's look at a second example. Suppose we have another random box, about 10 kilograms in mass, which is at rest on an inclined surface. Now let's suppose that this surface is inclined at a 30 degree angle relative to the horizontal. The question here is, what is the frictional force on the box? So since this thing is at rest, we know we're dealing with static friction. So static frictional force is what we're looking for. So a free body diagram, it's an inclined surface, gravity still goes down, the normal force is perpendicular to the surface, and the static frictional force is parallel to the surface. Now if there wasn't static friction on this object, it would just slide down, and so it's reasonable to guess that the static friction force goes up the incline. If that's not correct, then we'll end up with something uh, with a different sign than we're expecting or something like that, and we'll know it pretty soon. So I would now write a net force equation in the x direction. So we've got static friction going one direction and the x component of gravity going the other. And so we need to do a vector diagram for the weight. So there's my vector diagram. The 30 degree angle that the ramp makes with the horizontal, so that'd be this angle right here, is the same as that top angle in my triangle when I resolve my weight. And so the x component would be the opposite side, so I'd use the sine function. And so the x component of gravity is equal to mg sine 30 degrees. The net force is zero since it's at rest. And so the static frictional force equals the x component of gravity. And so that would be equal to mg sine 30. So plugging in the numbers, remember g is 10 newtons per kilogram. And it gives me a static frictional force of 50 newtons.
And again, don't forget about the direction. It's going up the incline. So next, let's kind of talk about how big can static friction actually get? Because it can't obviously increase to infinity. It's got to be some maximum value. So that maximum force that static friction is capable of exerting is going to depend on the same two things that the kinetic frictional force depended on. Namely, the normal force between the surfaces and then the nature of the surfaces again. We'll again quantify that with a coefficient of friction, but this time we'll call it mu subscript s, or the static coefficient of friction. And so the static coefficient of friction is going to be a different number than the kinetic coefficient of friction. And those two numbers are going to depend on just what the two surfaces are made out of. So your tires on concrete have a specific coefficient of friction, and that's something that can be measured. So I can kind of write it like this. I can say that the maximum static friction force is equal to mu s times the normal force. The way that it's more commonly written is to say that the static friction force is going to vary, like inequality, between 0 and mu times the normal force. So these are two different ways of stating the same thing. I believe that this inequality is a way that it's written on your uh, formula chart that you get to use on your AP exam. So it might be best if you familiarize yourself with that. Um, so the thing we understand here is that this quantity gives us the biggest possible value of static friction. Not necessarily the value that's actually um, expressed at any given time, but that tells us the maximum value. One more quick thing to note, static friction is always stronger than kinetic friction. And that goes back to Newton's first law of motion. Something's at rest, it prefers to stay at rest. So the reason for that is that the static coefficient of friction is always bigger than the kinetic coefficient of friction. And so that's always going to be true. Okay, so let's look at another example skip this part. Suppose we have a 100 kilogram box which is at rest on a level surface and we know that the static frictional coefficient is 0.8 and we got some strong man that wants to push it forwards. The question is how much force does he need to push with in order to get the box moving? So here's our free body diagram. We know that this thing weighs a thousand newtons which means the normal force on it is a thousand newtons since the surface is level. Push goes to the right, therefore the frictional force would go to the left. And so as we increase this value right here, static friction is also going to increase in order to keep this thing at rest. So what we need to realize is that the box is going to move when the force that we push with just exceeds the maximum static frictional force. And we find the maximum static frictional force by using mu s times the normal force. So plugging in the mu times the normal force would give me something like 800 newtons for the maximum static friction force. And so the box is going to start moving whenever the push force reaches 800 newtons. So we want to exceed 800 newtons, then this box will start to move, and it'll start to accelerate. Let's see if you can kind of do this example on your own, kind of putting together a lot of different things um, that we've used this unit. So suppose we've got a 5 kilogram box that's pulled to the right by a rope, which exerts 15 newtons of force, something we can measure. So draw a free body diagram. Find the force of friction on it, and then find the coefficient of friction, assuming that it's accelerating to the right at 2 meters per second squared. So press pause, see if you can do those three things real quick, and then press play again. See if you did it right. Okay, so let's see if you did it right. Here is uh, the first part of my free body diagram. I've got weight going down, normal force going up. 
Rope's pulling to the right, so there's the tension, and friction goes to the left. We should have drawn friction smaller than tension because it's accelerating to the right, so the bigger force must go to the right. Next thing I would have done is written a net force equation. So net force in the x direction is tension minus friction. Instead of net force, I can write MA, use Newton's second law. So wherever we see that, we can substitute in that. Solving for the force of friction could be tension minus the quantity MA. And plugging in the numbers, 15 newtons of tension. Your net force would be 10 newtons, 5 times 2. And so the frictional force would be 5 newtons, and it's directed to the left. So we can use the friction force equation to solve for the coefficient of kinetic friction. So mu k would be friction over normal force. So friction we just found was 5 newtons. The normal force would be equal to the weight, because it's got to balance the weight, and so that would be 50 newtons. And so dividing, we'd get a normal force of about, or excuse me, a um, coefficient of kinetic friction of about 0.1. Okay, some important things to remember. Remember we always can find the kinetic friction force, or use this equation rather, with kinetic friction, so force of kinetic friction, mu times the normal force. Remember that static friction is going to vary depending on the other forces. It's got a maximum value equal to the um, static coefficient of friction times the normal force. And then lastly, remember that the coefficient of static friction it's always going to be bigger than the coefficient of kinetic friction. So those are the important things to remember. In addition to all that, we need to not forget things that we already know, like how to draw a free body diagram, how to write a net force equation and solve it for what we're missing, how to analyze forces on an incline, all those good things still apply. So next time in class, we're going to try to put all these things together, I will see you then. Ta-ta.